This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, thank you to all of you listening. I really appreciate you joining us. And thank you so much, Jeff Olson, for being my guest today. Oh, it's my, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Heather, for having me. I read your book at least 10 years ago, and it really stuck with me. Um, you have probably the most heartbreaking story I've ever heard, but also really one of the most beautiful experiences as well. So can you take us back to your life just before you had the accident and then take us right on into your near-death experiences? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, and I can talk about it now. I mean, quite honestly, I could not even speak of this for almost a decade. And I didn't write the first book until 11 years after the accident. Um, the near-death experience is like it was yesterday. I'll never forget that. I had to do research on the details and know how long was I in the hospital? How many surgeries did I have? But my life before the accident, um, very happily married. We had two beautiful boys. Um, I was and still am a creative director in the advertising realm. Uh, my wife was a high school uh, teacher. She taught high school. And we had um, gone on a family vacation. It was a road trip. We had gone down to southern Utah to see all the beautiful red rocks and formations there. We lived in the northern part of Utah. And it was on the way back from that family trip um, that we, uh, my life changed <laughs> drastically. Uh, we had been visiting family there. We'd had a beautiful visit. And, you know, I'll never forget this. There's parts of this, like I say, are like yesterday. I'll never forget. And this was not part of the near-death or out-of-body experience. But we had said goodbye to her parents. We had hugged everyone, and we were just getting ready to drive away. We were on the car. I had buckled up the kids in their car seats. And as I was pulling away from the curb, my wife stopped me. She said, stop, wait. I, I thought she'd forgotten something. I thought, you know, she's left something in the house. I put the car in park and she said, I just want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. Now, I'll admit in that moment, I thought, oh, women, you know, we've hugged. We got to get on the road. We got to get out of here. But I noticed and watched and her mom and dad were on the porch, you know, waving like grandma and grandpa do. And, and uh, she jumped out of the car and she ran up to them. And I noticed how not only did she hug them both, but she kissed them. I watched her hug and kiss her mom and dad. And then she came running back to the car and jumped in. And, uh, you know, joyfully, we were on our way. I put the car in drive. I hit the interstate. I cranked the cruise control up to about 75 miles an hour, which is as fast as I could legally go. I was in a hurry to get back home and get back to work. And I had missed a day of work. And, you know, we're so silly that way. The stress of the things we believe are so important and they're really not, but I Absolutely. was hurrying. Yeah, I was hurrying to get back. But in hindsight of that day, um, her, her knowing her, that, that, that whisper that said, go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. I've really learned to honor that because as the day rolled out, that was the last goodbye. Um, we were probably, oh, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half into the drive. There was reports of crosswinds. There was reports of a pickup truck that was driving erratically on the interstate. Perhaps, Heather, one of the most difficult parts of the story is I may have dozed off at the wheel. I, I may have just nodded off for, for a second, not like I fell asleep, but nodded off. But what happened is I, I swerved to the right. I overcorrected to the left. I lost control of the car. And the car began to roll, not off the street, but down the street, down the interstate on that hard concrete at 75 miles an hour. And it was a horrible automobile accident. Um, you know, it only takes seconds, but uh, as the car rolled, I blacked out. But when the car came to a stop, I was completely conscious. The, the first thing I heard was my seven-year-old, my oldest son, crying 
hysterically in the back seat. And I thought, I've got to get to my boy. I've got to get to my son. And that's when I realized I couldn't move. I, I was pinned either to the floorboard or the seat. I couldn't tell. There was the rancid smell of gasoline and the broken glass. And I was unaware of my injuries. I was in pain. I was struggling to breathe. I knew I was losing consciousness. I didn't realize what had happened. Both of my legs had been crushed. Uh, the left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. My back had been broken in two places, just cracked the vertebrae. It didn't, it didn't damage the spinal column. But my right arm had nearly been torn off. The whole rotator cuff and everything was torn out. Um, my rib cage had been damaged. My lungs were collapsing. And the, uh, the seat belt had cut through and ruptured all my insides. I, I had no idea. I just knew my son was crying. I had to get to my son. And that's when... That's when the realization hit that no one else was crying. And I realized I was very much aware at the scene of the accident that Tamara, my, my beloved wife, and my baby boy were gone. That they had been killed instantly in the accident. And there really aren't words to explain the, gosh, the hell, you know, that that, that was. I mean, here I was pinned. I was losing consciousness. I had a hysterical child I couldn't get to. I knew half the family was gone. And I was driving the car. I mean, the guilt, the regret, it's like, can't, how do I, you know, how do I roll back those three seconds? What happened? And it was in that darkness. It was in that moment. And I talk a lot about moments. I think life is like a string of pearls. It's moments, 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 moments. We'd gone from this beautiful moment where she's hugging her mom and dad. And now it's a different moment. And I was so distraught. And then I, I lost consciousness or things went black. But in that moment, light came. And, and it's difficult to describe, but it felt as if light came to me, like light came and encircled me. It was, it was comforting me in this hysteria, you know, this horrible trauma of what had happened. It felt as if I was rising above the accident scene. And suddenly I was okay. It's like, oh, I can breathe. I, I'm not in pain. I, I, and I was confused. I'm like, how am I okay? And as that, as I was coming to terms with, wow, I'm, I'm really okay. Tamara, my wife, who I knew was deceased at the scene, Suddenly, she was there in this light with me, and she was gorgeous. Um, she was radiant. I, I always hesitate to talk about the details of the accident, but what I was aware of and what had happened is she had actually laid her seat back and was napping. And because she had laid her seat ba back, the seat belt had not you know, restrained her properly, and she had suffered... Um, some pretty severe head trauma, and that's what took her life. And I was aware of that. And yet here in this light, she was gorgeous. She was beautiful. There was no injuries. She was very much alive. And she was communicating with me. She, I mean, I mean it, she was emphatic. Jeff, 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 you can't stay. You, you, you got to go back. You got to go back. You can't be here. And we literally had a conversation. The conversation around my oldest son, Spencer, who was only seven at the time, and the conversation was, you got to go back. We can't orphan our boy. You got to go back and raise our child. And we literally, we, we made a deal. Um, she couldn't come back. I could. And, and I chose to come back. We, 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 I gave her my word. I'll go back. I'll go raise our boy. And, um, I became so aware of choice. In that moment, it's like, wow, um, here I was looking at the woman I loved more than life, but I knew I had a little boy in the back of that car who was going to be okay. And I, I made the choice to come back. I said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. And then I literally found myself moving about a hospital. Now I'm saying myself, I... You know, I have no concept of time in this accident. What I found out is people arrived at the scene. 
Spencer, my seven-year-old, was a bit banged up. Griffin, my baby, um, he had his car seat had broken up. He had been ejected from the car, and I, I, it's been 26 years. I still have trouble talking about that. Um, I had to be extricated from the car and airlifted or life flighted to the nearest level one trauma center. I, I was unaware of any of that. What I was aware of is I'd crashed the car. Half the family was gone. I left my body. I had said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. And now here I had found myself moving about this hospital. And I was me, and I was my consciousness, and I was seeing the doctors and the nurses and the patients and the families of the patients. But when I say I was seeing them, I was truly seeing them. I mean, I was, I was experiencing the essence of everything they were. And uh, I call it a oneness. I was experiencing this profound connection to everyone. And, and you know, they were strangers in this realm, but out of the body and, and in that different consciousness. Wow, I knew them. I knew their love, their hate, their challenges, their motivations, their, uh, I mean, for instance, and this is just, this is just one instance, but this nurse passed me, completely unaware of me, but boy, was I aware of her. And I felt and experienced and knew the abuse that she had received as a child, the physical, emotional, sexual abuse. I, I felt it in such a real way. And yet in that same moment, I thought, wow, look at that. You know, here she is healing and serving and, 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 and her, I, 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 I was aware of her magnificence as a soul. And that was true of everyone I saw. It didn't matter what they had done or what they hadn't done or what had happened. I was connected in this oneness of, of humanity, if you will. And I, I grew up in a conservative Christian home. I, I even had a biblical verse come up. You know, this may have been my conditioning, but there was this beautiful verse. It's a famous verse in the Bible where Jesus said, in as much as you've done it unto the least of one of these, You've done it unto me. And the reason I bring this up is this was so profound because I had grown up believing that was a nice verse about being nice. And it is. You're, you're kind to each other, right? But there was this expansion of that. And I thought, oh, wow, now I get it. They are me. I am them. What, what Jesus was saying is I, I, am, I am the prisoner you know, in jail. I am the beggar on the street. I am the stranger that's simply looking for acceptance. And I was experiencing this oneness in such a profound way. And that changed me forever. I, I, I see people differently, <laughs> you know, judgments and comparisons went out the window until I finally came up on a body or a man or, you know, that I didn't, I didn't feel this from. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's strange. And so I stepped forward and that's when I realized, oh my goodness, that's, that's me or, or, or that, that's not me. I'm, I'm having this profound connected experience, but there's my body. There's the flesh. There's the skin suit, if you will, that I've been wandering about my life in. And, and there was a profound sadness because the body was such a wreck. I was in a really horrible state. I also had this deep insight to what a miracle the body is. What a miraculous machine. I mean, I became very aware that I don't have to remind my heart to beat or tell my lungs to breathe or, or, or teach my eyes how to see. I, I mean, I, I became so aware of how beautiful and how miraculous the body is. And mine was so broken. And I realized I've taken this for granted my whole life. You know, I mean, I had been a Division One athlete. I was always healthy. I, I, I never even thought about it. So there was this profound sadness around that. And I knew I had to get back in that broken body. And, um, you know, in, in, my, in my upbringing, I'd always read and heard, uh, you know, your body is a temple. Wow, I was experiencing that at a whole new expanded level. 
Oh, <laughs> now, yeah, it truly, it's, it's a holy thing. I mean, how, how did I not see that? And I made the choice again. I'm going back in. I'm going back in, and I, I didn't have to figure out how to do so. It's the intention. You know, we have no idea how powerful our thoughts are. It's like I'm going back in. And then, boom, I was back in the body, back in all that grief, that, that trauma, the, the guilt, the regret, the, the, the sadness, the, the physical pain. Um, I was in a horrible state. I mean, I, I had a, you know, they had ventilated me. So there was a big tube, you know, down my throat doing the breathing for my lungs. My legs were immobile. My right arm was immobile. My torso is all torn open. And they eventually tied down my left hand because I kept grabbing at all the medical equipment. And I simply um, just laid there and wallowed in it. Now, there's an interesting experience that I didn't find out till later. Uh, when they life flighted me into the trauma center, um, as they worked to save my life, the attending physician, a fellow named Dr. Jeff O'Driscoll, he's become a very good friend of mine actually at this point, he and a nurse had a profound experience in the operating room. They, they were strangers. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. But as they worked on me, both of them experienced my wife's presence, my deceased wife's soul in the operating room, and she communicated with the doc. I call him the doc, Dr. O'Driscoll. She communicated to him. Now, when he came and shared this with me, you know, a month or better after the accident, and I was in the hospital for almost six months, I had 18 surgeries in total piecing me back together, and I didn't speak about my experience. When he came and shared what he had experienced, and I'm not sure what inspired him to do so. I just wept and I thought, okay, I'm not crazy. And uh, we became very good friends based on that. And I asked him, what was she communicating? What did she say? And he said, she simply was sharing her gratitude for all we were doing to save your life. And I thought, of course she was. That, that's exact, that's who she was. But they didn't know I'd made this deal. They didn't know we had talked. They didn't know that, you know, she sent me back. My friends tease me now and say, your own wife kicked you out of heaven. And I'm like, well, I guess she did. But, you know, there's a, there's a profound connection with Dr. O'Driscoll and I because all of a sudden there was a safe place to talk about this. I mean, he was a clinician. If I was crazy... He could put me in the psych ward and get me the treatment that was necessary. But he said, no, no, no. We experienced something profound as well. And what's neat about that is so many people, when they hear a near-death experience, they want evidence. Yeah. And there you have two other people that pretty much back up your story. Right. Yeah. The, the doctor has gone very public. The nurse, and bless her, she's a kind soul. She's, she's still practicing. She said, I don't want people to think I'm that nurse that sees dead people. You know, I mean, um, so, you know, I've, I've very much respected that and honored that. Uh, Dr. O'Driscoll didn't speak of it publicly until he took a sabbatical from practice. And um, it's a funny story. I mean, Suddenly on my Facebook page way back in the day, um, you know, he, he'd written this big long thing on my page and <laughs> I had all these followers and he had talked about his experience in the operating room, which he'd kept very private. And I called him. I said, Doc, you realize that, that that's not to me like everybody can see it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know how social media works. I realize it. He said, I just felt it was time for me to speak about it. And he's... um He's a he's an incredible gentleman. Um, he's still a dear friend, and uh, and he's he's assisting a lot of people. Um, in fact, he said, "I think I'll assist a lot more people spiritually than I ever did physically as an ER doc." Just being willing to say, "Hey, I've had these experiences," and mine wasn't the first experience he'd had in the ER. And he wrote a book. Yeah, he wrote a book called "Not Yet," and. Um, it's about his experiences as an ER doc when he would feel and communicate and sometimes even see, not necessarily with physical eyes, but he would see souls leave the body. He would, he's, he, he's a very, um, 
I suppose gifted might be the, the word, but he's, he's a very good physician who is very open to the spiritual things. To, to me, he's that guy that brings science and spirituality onto common ground in a very profound way. And yet he had to wait really yeah. until he was done practicing, it sounds like, before he really let the public know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I know a few doctors, and I'm not a medical professional at all, but it may not have been that well expected. <laughs> Maybe that wouldn't have been good for his career if he was talking openly about what he saw in the ER sometimes. Now, as you continued to stay in the hospital toward the end of your hospital stay when you were in rehabilitation, you had what I think is the most beautiful experience. Can you fill us in on that? Oh, yeah. And, and it is. It's profound. It's probably worth pointing out the two most incredible out-of-body or near-death experiences were at the scene of the accident before any narcotics had been administered. And boy, in the hospital, I was on morphine and, you know, all kind of opiates. It, it, you know, there was, I, it was a long, rough, rough stay. I kept throwing pulmonary emboli, the blood clots that lodge in your lungs. I had horrible infections. Anyway, I was through all that. I was out of ICU. I was out of surgical recovery. I was actually in the rehabil rehabilitation wing, as you pointed out. And I had another profound out-of-body experience. And I can't, I can't even articulate the grief. You know, I mean, there was so much physical trauma, but the emotional trauma was worse. And uh, I was finally able to sleep on my side. They had stabilized my intestines and abdominum. I mean, I had a colostomy. And I, and there's so many things that went on, but I was able to sleep on my side in the rehabilitation wing, which is how I naturally sleep. And I, I fell into a deep sleep. And it was strange. It's like I was aware, oh, I'm actually sleeping. There was so much trauma. I, I'd been unconscious, but I don't know that I had slept peacefully. But it was a peaceful sleep, and I felt that light come again that familiar light that came and embraced me in my grief. And it felt as if I was rising above the hospital bed. But this time, the, the, the light, if you will, it dispensed. It, it, it lifted, and I, I found myself in the most beautiful place. Um, people say heaven. You know, they say the spirit world. There's all kinds of words the only word that comes close to what I experienced is I was home. I was home. I, 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 I was so welcomed. I was so, it was so familiar. I was so familiar. I was home and, and I was so joyful. I began to run. Now, this is interesting because I don't run in this realm with the conditions of, you know, my left leg is amputated. My right leg has six pins and a plate holding it together. My back is messed up. My hips are messed up. In this realm, I was running. And the odd thing is how physical it felt. I mean, I could feel the energy of the ground under my feet. I, I could feel the intelligence in my toes, in my calves, in my thighs. I, 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 it was so invigorating. It's like my senses were just multiplied. And I was running, thinking, I'm home. I'm home. And Again, I was delivered from the grief and the trauma. But I also got the message, you're not here to stay. You know, and I had made that deal. I was going to go raise our son, and he had seen me in the hospital, and he'd been in and out of there. But my heart just broke for my son who had passed. And when I got this message or this knowing that I wasn't there to stay, immediately there was like this corridor off to my left, and I knew intuitively I'm to go that way. I, I just knew. I, and so I did. I began working my way down this corridor. And as I did, at the end of the corridor was a crib. Now, my, my youngest son was only 14 months. He was just learning to walk and talk, and he was still sleeping in a crib. And so I rushed to that crib, and I looked in it, and there was my little boy. And he was perfect. He was beautiful. And I, 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 you know, I swept him up and held him in my arms. And I don't know if you've ever picked up a sleeping child. Oh, yes. Um, but there's a weight and a heat, you know, ab about them. And I, I held him close to me. And again, it was so physical. He was solid. 
I could feel his breathing. I could feel his breath on my neck. I, I leaned over and I smelled his hair. Um, it always, it always triggers emotion because it's like, I, I don't know if you've ever smelled the hair of a loved one, but it's like, that's my boy and he's here and he's okay. And I begin to weep. And as I was experiencing this, there was this profound presence behind me, this, this powerful, cosmic, overwhelming presence. And it kept moving closer and closer as I'm weeping, holding my little boy. And again, perhaps my upbringing, I thought, wow, that's, that's God. It was so powerful. I thought, that's God. And the guilt began to bubble up. My little boy's here because I crashed the car. You know, I, I lost control and cut his life short. And I'm weeping, holding my little boy. And I'm thinking I'm in so much trouble. And... I'm feeling this presence come closer and closer. And I became fearful. And I had the thought, I hope there's some way I can be forgiven. And it was, it was with that thought that this presence came so close. And this, this felt physical too. I'm holding my little boy crying in this trauma of guilt. And I felt these divine arms just wrap around and hold me and my little boy. And that's when the, the lid just came off, if you will. There was this download of love and peace and comprehension. I, I, you know, it was this, it's almost as if we became one, like my little boy became me and we became all there is. And the first thing that was communicated to me, and it wasn't necessarily with words, it was just flooding into me, is there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in pure divine order. Now, I, you know, I, I, I still had my thoughts. I'm like, yeah, but how can that be? You know, my little boy's here. And then I was shown my life. I, I, I've learned it's called the life review. I saw my life. I saw my parents' divorce. I saw the insecurities that created in me. I saw that even my aptitude in athletics was just a little boy insecure trying to prove that he was good enough or okay or whatever. I saw my brothers. I saw the accident. I saw so many things, even things that I was like, well, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. I didn't mean to do that. And this beautiful being that held me said, there are no mistakes. What did you learn? And I was seeing my life in a complete different context. In fact, I saw things and I thought, well, that was wrong. And I know that was wrong. And I knew it was wrong then and I did it anyway. And the being that held me said, that's your judgment of it, not ours. We love you. You are as beloved as the little boy you hold. And, and that was the interesting thing of this experience. I mean, here I was holding my own son in the arms of God and God saying, that's how we feel about you. I mean, you are, you are as profound and beloved and perfect. And, and, and it was a very personal experience, but I also realized it rippled out to everyone, to every living soul. And I began to make some sense of what I was experiencing in the hospital. And there was so many things shared and communicated. And it was all very personal. One of the biggest things communicated again was choice. Um, you know, and, 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 and life. I mean, I, I had grown up believing that life was a test and that God was going to judge me. And I was probably in trouble because I was failing the test. But in those arms and watching my life, suddenly the realization came that life is a gift. It's a profound, beautiful gift, and there was so much love. And our choices, I mean, and, and this sounds very strange, but as I was held, it was communicated to me, I want you to exercise your will. And I was like, what? I, I mean, it's it's your will be done. I've been taught that since I was a child. And, and God said to me, my will is your will. That's how much... We love you. My will has always been that you have free will. That is, that is my will. And I want you to make a choice. 
And it was communicated to me that I could be angry at God my whole life because of what happened, that the car crashed and half the family went. I was also told I could be angry with myself. I could beat myself up in guilt for the rest of my life. And all of this was in love. It was all like, look, you get to make the choice. But I was given a third choice. I was told, you can give your son to me. You can, you can hand him over and trust and exercise your will. And that will be honored in the entire universe. I felt, I felt so, I, I don't know the word. I felt so important. I felt so beloved. It's like the whole universe was watching my silly life and my choice, but there was so much love and no judgment. And in all that beauty and all that peace, I, I was able to kiss my little boy and hand him over. I gave him back. And then I woke up back in the hospital bed to the amputation, the colostomy, the shoulder. I mean, it was a, I was a mess. But yeah, that was maybe the most profound out of body near death experience. Um, and it sounds, I, I, even now I realize it sounds crazy. There I was holding my child in the arms of God. And, and yet it was communicated in such a powerful way that we're all children. We're all that beloved. We're all that precious. We're all that glorious in the eyes of the divine. Um, and yeah, it, it, it changed me. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's a very difficult story, but as I mentioned, it's also a very beautiful story. I have a lot of questions, but let's take that into part two. Thanks so much for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. That was part one. Make sure to listen to part two. And if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more episodes.